for better or worse, there's never been another movie quite like Night Train to Terror. And how could there be? This isn't just one movie. It's three movies in one. None of these movies felt releasable on their own. It's much like Spookies or Freight House. Those three movies were all shoved together into one furnace. Kind of like how coal powers the engine of a train. Unlike those films, which just jam stories together, the stories here are linked by a framing sequence of a band that's traveling through the night unwell, a night train to terror. All the while, God, who is played by Ferdy Main, who we may have seen as Count Von Crowlock in The Fearless Vampire Killers, or you may have also seen in Halloween 2, he felt this movie was so bad that he penned a letter to its director. And Satan, who is Tony DiGiorgio, uh, who wasn't just Bruno Tataglia in The Godfather, but also the Playboy's Club in-house gambling expert, He's also the sheriff in another film by the same team that made this, the Bigfoot-centric Cry Wilderness. They're just a few cars down, debating whether or not the band will live to see their next destination. Oh, did I mention a band? Oh yeah, there's a band on this train. And there's also a night porter who makes faces at the camera years before single camera shows like The Office and Curb Your Enthusiasm made such reg mugging regular for the course. But let's get to know the band because you're going to get to see them over and over again. Every story will have a repeat of the chorus over and over and over again. They only take breaks to ask if they can get some hamburgers and beer, only to learn there's no food on this train, and that some call it the Heavenly Express. Others call it Satan's Cannonball. They only do guarantee to deliver every passenger to its right destination. Obviously, neither of the things people call the train are as good as Night Train to Terror, but that's a moot point. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody So if you like that song, you're going to hear it a whole bunch of more times in this movie. But to determine the fate of these breakdancing fools, seriously, a band with 50 people, this is like the polyphonic spree, has to be the worst ever because you have to split the door money every which way. The divine creator and the first of the fallen decide to watch three different stories, at least one of which was a totally unfinished movie. The first film is The Case of Harry Billings. It stars John Philip Law, who you may know as the angel from Barbarella, or maybe Diabolic has been manipulated into working for the spare body parts black market. You know how that goes, right? Well, this story is packed with nonsensical jump cuts, unnecessary surgery, gratuitous nudity, and Richard Mall wasn't even there for most of the scenes, with a double playing most of the times he's in action. You can tell because the second version of Richard Mall has incredibly hairy arms. And while this film wasn't finished before it was pulled into the film, it was later released on VHS to scream your head off as a full movie. It was also released many years later as Marilyn Alive Behind Bars probably about 10 years later. And much like the film Terror, Sexy, Sexo Ye Brugera, this movie was partially made years before and finished, you know, like I said, 10 years later. Uh, the fact that this movie was actually finished makes me overjoyed beyond belief. What's crazy is Maryland Behind Bars, some of it is shot on completely different film stock, some of it's shot on video, some of it has John Philip Law, about 12 years age difference, and, uh, you know, he's a handsome man, but he, we do age. Um, so even though this movie was somewhat released twice and sh I actually shot twice because there's nude and non-nude versions of some scenes, uh, you know, the 1981 one is even crazier. Uh, he made the movie, uh, the director made the movie he always wanted to make. For some reason, he also hired Francine York from Secret File Hollywood to play Marilyn Monroe. Or maybe she's just a woman who's gone crazy and believes that she's Norma Jean. But in this longer version, Harry Billings was driving home with his new wife when he got sideswiped. She died. This leads to him sleeping barefoot on her grave. He tries to jump off a bridge on the very same road where this accident happened, and he gets brought to the asylum of Dr. Brewer and Otto, who is Richard Ball. They abduct women whose brains will be lobotomized, and some of this new movie, like I said, is shot on video, which looks wild because you're going to see a lot of differences in characters, different actors playing different people. As messy as the chapter written within Night Train to Terror, the full length story is almost deliriously insane. It has time lapse errors, sound quality errors, just plain weird errors. I would also love to see this released as a cleaned up version and kind of put together, but we're going to get what we get. So, anyway, that's the first story, The Case of Harry Billings. The second is The Case of Greta Connors. And this is probably most, I'm going to say most Night Train to Terror fans, I can think of two of us, uh, favorite part of the movie. 
There's a nice young girl who used to work at the carnival. A man visits her booth, pays her to go out with him. Before you know it, she's a porn star. Again, that's how life goes in the world of Night Train to Terror. One day, a college guy named Glenn, who's played by Rick Barnes, sees Greta on a stag loop, and he falls in love. As these things happen, he finds her, he starts a relationship, and he finds her old Hollywood producer sugar daddy husband who brings him to a suicide club to talk. Where these exist, I don't know, but the club has a baroness and a guy who looks and acts a lot like Jimi Hendrix. And they're all playing these death games like a giant claymation beetle. There's a lot of claymation in Night Train to Terror. Fly around and sting one of them to death, or they lie in sleeping bags until a giant ball crushes one of them to death. But back to Jimmy, at some point he gets electrocuted as he sings song lyrics. Like all the stories in this film, there's another much longer version, which has multiple titles. The Dark Side of Love, Carnival Fools, Greta, or Death Wish Club, which is the title that is still on Tubi. Uh, it could come down at any moment, but you should watch it as soon as you can. The uh, full film claims it's based on Erskine Caldwell's book, Greta, but I don't really know. Much like an Italian giallo who claims it's based on a novel, are any of them really based on a novel? Pre-med student Glenn Marshall is following from Greta, who's Meredith Hayes, who is astounding in this movie. I wish she'd done more than just this role. She's a motivational speaker today. The first time he sees her in an adult film, he falls in love. Again, same story. She's owned by a man named George Youngmeyer, her Hollywood producer husband, who bought her all those years ago at the carnival. Uh, a lot of people think, including the website Bloody Pit of Horror, believe that this movie is all about writer Philip Jordan. We'll get to him in a second. Um, who never fell out of love with cat people actress Simone Simon. Uh, I'm probably saying it wrong, Simone Simone. And just treated the rest of his wives like uh, George Youngmeyer treats his wife in here. So that's kind of maybe, maybe super autobiographical. But who can say? Now, if you'll excuse us for a second, hold on to your valuables. The train is going to take a quick detour so we can explain who Philip Jordan is. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody but you. Come on and dance with me, dance with me. Dance with me, dance with me. Come on and dance with me, dance with me. Philip Yardan is a listed writer on nearly 100 movies, including Dillinger, Detective Story, and Broken Lance, which is a movie he won the best original Oscar for. Uh, it's a remake of 1949's House of Strangers. So how do you win an original story Oscar for that? And the fact that he probably didn't write a single word of the actual script. A lot of people believe that many of the movies that Philip Yardan wrote were actually a front for blacklisted writers who still wanted to make films, giving Yardan all the credit and half the paycheck. He was literally a factory at this point, he wrote for every studio, even when he wasn't supposed to because of contracts. In the late 1950s, Jordan finally got caught. He had mixed up two scripts. He had delivered a Fox script to Warner Brothers and vice versa. And seeing how he had to deal with Fox, Daryl F. Zanuck threatened to get him blackballed at all the major studios. A few years later, his secretary would claim that she was the actual writer of The Rise and Fall of Legs Diamond. Things got so bad that Columbia demanded that he have an office directly on their lot so that they could watch him write at all times, guaranteeing that he was the author. And despite these new rules and even heightened surveillance, Jordan still hustled scripts at other studios. He got caught again and was forced to pay back money. But this time, he really was told, you can never eat lunch in this town again. So how did he get to the point where he was still making movies? Well, he ended up in Spain working for Samuel L. Bronston, using folks like Ray Bradbury, Ben Barsman, Arnaud Dessault, Julian Halevi, and Bernard Gordon to write scripts pretty widely accepted that Bernard Gordon wrote Day of the Triffins, not Philip Jordan, no matter what the credits say. But by the mid-60s, he was somehow back in the good graces of Hollywood, a survivor working as a script doctor on a ton of movies like Horror Express, which is also a horror movie set on a train, and Psychomania. At the end of his life, he worked as an adjunct screenwriting instructor at San Diego State University. He was writing scripts for all kinds of movies, like Marilyn Alive and Behind Bars, which we already talked about, Cataclysm, which is the first movie in this, Cry Wilderness, The Unholy, and this movie. There's a great article by the Film Noir Foundation, The Philip Yardin Story, that has a very telling sentence. Yardin's furtive 50 year, year history is a reminiscent of the Hall, Hall Mirrors from Lady of Shanghai. But back to Death Wish Club, and here's where the full story goes even deeper. In this movie, when Glenn finally tracks down Greta, she thinks that she's a fish, and as such, won't leave her bathtub. And this. <laughs> 
movie, as you can tell, has already been pretty weird. It gets a lot stranger. So to solve this issue, uh, her producer husband asks Glenn to visit, make love to her in front of him, and he's then allowed to take her home. Aubrey he warns her that she lives in the fourth dimension. And we're, this is never explained in the movie. A lot of this, probably why I love Death Wish Club, the Greta part of the story, is just things happen. Our protagonist gets more than he bargained for here. Is, uh, Greta turns out to be the kind of sexual dynamo that he's only read about in the letters of letter pages of men's magazines. And she's only happy when a man is taking her. Otherwise, she's selling your TV set. She's bringing a piano in the house. She'll appear in front of your mother naked. She's a fantasy woman for Glenn, but removed from the fantasy male gaze, she remains trapped within the role of the fantasy male gaze. I mean, she's perfect for 10-minute interludes, but uh, she's potentially exhausting in real life, and he does not know how to deal with her. Uh, and this is a really strange thing for a movie to admit. Generally, the hero is a man who is very potent, and Greta is way... Well, you'll get to it. She's more masculine than him. Anyway, she's also turned on the adrenaline that comes from putting herself in near-death situations, which is how we get back to the Suicide Club. And the Suicide Club has Frederico Liabus, Contessa Pacelli, and Prince Flabudu, who is the person that we're led to believe is Jimi Hendrix. So again, much like in the short version from Night Train, uh, the claymation Tasmanian wing be uh, beetle almost kills Glenn. He decides that no sex is worth this. He tries to get back to his former girlfriend, back to his normal, normal life. But his old girlfriend tells him he's never going to be free of Greta. There's a new problem, though. She's overdosed and she's dead. The young Meyer proves it by taking Glenn to her funeral. He's lost, and he makes his way back to the club where he first saw her dancing in the video of her. And she's playing piano. And it turns out she's still there, but now she has become a piano-playing film noir tough guy named Charlie White. And I mean guy. She hasn't left the suicide club either, which means Glenn keeps getting pulled in contests where they almost survive a homemade electric chair as well as being forced at gunpoint to get in a sleeping bag and be in the path of a deadly multi-ton wrecking ball. This movie does not stop. So can our protagonist get the man or woman he's in love with to become the woman or man he's in love with and afraid of and sexually attracted to? We have to break into her wedding like the graduate and do some kung fu. Why is she glad that Ch Chopin is dead as she screams at one point? Death Wish Club is an astounding piece of movie making. It's almost David Lynch before David Lynch was David Lynch, which is kind of the best kind of film, a film that's near a cult level weird. I think the people making it, obviously, like Philip Yardan, were all very damaged, just had no clue how humanity behaves. They may have come here for a parallel dimension. Maybe that's how they meet women there. It's the very definition of monkeys in a room banging something out on typewriters and somehow finding nirvana. So let's discuss the other Philip Yardan in this, or the other Yardan in this. It's uh, Byron. You've seen the movie, obviously. You've already heard them a couple times for the episode. Trust me, you'll hear them again. But the band that appears when each segment is singing that song, Everybody But You. The main singer and break dancer, who you will see again and again, is Byron Yordan. He's also in the Mormon film that most of the same crew made, Savage Journey, as Brigham Young's second son. Of the other band members and dancers, only Melanie Motilla, who was in Break Into Electric Boogaloo, Richard Sanford, who had a guest spot on Magnum P.I., Dina Lee Russo, who sang Let the Good Times Roll on the soundtrack of the wrestling documentary Beyond the Mat. Angela Nicoletti, who is the ex fiance of Guns N' Roses rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin. She's one of the girls in the Sweet Child of Mine video. And The Real McCoy, a documentary by Andy McCoy, who is the lead guitarist of Hanoi Rocks. And Rick Arbuckle, who worked on the sound of plenty of movies uh, and cartoons like Rugrats and Rocco's Modern Life. So actually, the band actually did stuff, but there's so many of them that if only five did stuff, it's not a good percentage anyway but it's really amazing that the song is written by joe toronto who just four years later was singing the little mermaid for disney and that's how things work everybody's got something to do everybody but you come on and dance with me dance with me dance with me dance with me come on and dance with me dance with me I warned you that that song would keep coming back. And anyway, we're in the final segment, which is the case of Claire Hansen. And this is Cataclysm, uh, which is a much longer, stranger, different movie. But anyway, I'll give you the short of what happens in Night Train, and then we'll get into the longer one. But in the case of Claire Hansen, a surgeon battles a demon who was once a Nazi, who is also in conflict with a Holocaust survivor, who is best friends with Cameron Mitchell. Additionally, that surgeon 
is married to Richard Mall, back again with a constantly changing hairstyle and color throughout this segment, who inexplicably was awarded the Nobel Prize for writing a book that proves God is dead. He is James uh, Hansen. Uh, Claire Hansen is his wife, obviously, and she's the surgeon. And this story has it all from a swinging disco to a magical black man who calls out our, her our heroine for America's history of racism. More claymation than in the entire movie because practical effects were the claymation. Uh, more claymation scenes in the place of practical special effects because claymation was the CGI of the past. An ex priest named Papini, who has a 666 tattoo, and as much of a 90 minute movie as you can fit into 30. The full version is known as many titles, it's in the public domain, and it's The Nightmare Never Ends, aka Cataclysm, aka Satan's Supper. And it gets way deeper. The previously mentioned Nobel Prize winning author, James Hansen, Richard Mall, who is in this movie twice. And I have a RIP Richard Mall. I have a theory that every 80s movie had to have him in it. And most of my favorites do House, Evil Speak, Metal Storm, The Direction of Jared's Sin, The Sword and the Sorcerer, The Dungeon Master. Anyway, Richard Mall is an atheist. He's married to a devoutly Catholic wife named Claire, who is uh, Faith Clift, who was the wife at the time of Philip Yardan and whose career is made up of films. He had something to do with like horror express, captain Apache, savage journey and cry wilderness. As the movie begins, they've just arrived in Vegas to celebrate his new book and to hopefully escape her nightmares. Oh yeah. That noble prize proved that God is dead. And now he's making a TV special to tell the whole world. He's basically preaching the bad news instead of the good news. Remember when the good news, if you were alive in the seventies, churches always talk about it. Anyway, in Vegas, they go to a show and a magician puts Claire into a trance. We learn that the real problem is Nazis. Every night she dreams of a handsome young officer who kills a room full of other officers and an all-female string orchestra. After the show, Claire invites that magician to dinner. He tells her the demon is after her. He never makes it and he is killed uh, and a 666 tattoo is left on his scalp. Meanwhile, Mr. Weiss, who is Mark Lawrence, uh, who is amazing, another talent who was damaged by the blacklist, uh, he also directed The Incredible Pigs, a.k.a. how many titles? The 13th Pig, Daddy's Deadly Darling, Horror Farm, Daddy's Girl, The Strange Exorcism of Lynn Hart, The Strange Love Exorcist, and Roadside Torture Chamber. And Bill Van Ryn, uh, my partner on the uh, Driving Asylum double feature, probably knows 50 more titles, is an older gentleman who just so happens to have survived the Holocaust and suddenly sees the man who made his life hell at Auschwitz on a TV program about the New York Ballet. And that is the same guy from Claire's Dream. That is uh, Olivier. Uh, Robert Bristol. Uh, Weiss is a Nazi hunter and he calls in uh, Lieutenant Stern, who is his neighbor, who, oh, yeah, it's Cameron Mitchell, who has been in so many movies and made a letterbox list for him. But let's just say probably Blood and Black Lace is his best film. They go to the ballet and they follow the devil to his extravagant mansion. All the while, Stern tries to convince his friend that this man could not be the guy who had him in a concentration camp. Weiss grabs his Luger and goes to kill Olivier, but an unseen demon kills him and also leaves the 666 on his body. There's also a former priest named Papini, named Maurice Grand Mason, who played him, who played Brigham Young in Savage Journey and is also in Cry Wilderness, who is now homeless. He spends most of the movie trying to protect James and Claire, even telling her how to kill the demon, which, go figure, is a lot like The Omen. This is a movie that doesn't miss any exploitation genre. It's got Nazis, tough cops, disco, the occult, and then Claire goes to visit a black spiritualist who goes off on a rant and blames her for uh, all the racism of the U.S., pushing this film towards black exploitation. And he nearly derails, and I'm sorry for that pun, the entire world by yelling at her, I am a black man in your country. You are a rich woman, and you have powerful friends, but they couldn't help you. You had to seek the help of a black man. Anytime I say black man, you can imagine the words he actually used. I am not going to say them. Meanwhile, Papini has been killed by a, Papini. Papini has been killed by Ishtar, Olivier's assistant, who we have never seen before. I have no idea. This is a scene probably for the foreign buyers. I would say it's the only nudity in the film. There's a lot of blasphemy. This film is all blasphemy, but oh, there's a lot here. If you're in a metal band, go watch this whole movie, Cataclysm, and just record samples. Electric Wizard, if you're out there, there's great samples in this for you. Making this film even more deranged is the fact that nearly every single actor in this movie either reads their line in monotone or screams them as loudly as possible, often within the same sentence, except for Richard Mall, who's probably the best actor here, Cameron Mitchell, who's the gruffest cop of all time. And strangely enough, Richard Mall used to date Tony Lawrence, who's Mark Lawrence's daughter. When we asked her, she wasn't sure if she had met, they had met yet. Uh, this is only a second role, but they had dated for some time. And 
when she was on our show, she said, you know, he was a great actor and I hated that he was in Night Court and I hated he was in all those crappy horror movies. So that made us feel good about ourselves. So anyway, let's see if I can surmise the ending of this film. After Olivia kills everyone, Claire hits him with a car. She throws her bo his body in the trunk and takes him to surgery where she and her nephew's girlfriend, again, where is this person coming from? Give him open heart surgery. There's blood spraying, puking, stabbing, slapping, screaming, and none of it works because the bad guy lives. But somehow this proves that God is alive. And how do we know God is alive? Because he's still on the night train to terror. Yep. Are you ready? We're going to probably hear that song one more time for the end of the episode. Wouldn't you just love to see this band die in a great train disaster? Well, good news. You're going to have your wish granted, except God has now taken their souls up to heaven. And we see an animated train choo chewing into the clouds where the nameless band will forever sing their song, driving cherubim and seraphim crazy for eternity. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody but you. Come on and dance with me, dance with me. Dance with me, dance with me. Come on and dance with me, dance with me. Dance with me, dance with me. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody but you. So you made it. To say Night Train of Terror is a strange movie, to say that I'm interested in Joe D'Amato movies. I can not love a movie where Satan is credited as playing by Lucifer and God by himself. I said, if you decide to buy a ticket on this train, prepare to never escape that song. You probably heard it so many times in this. Uh, I could sometimes be free for a few days of its powers, and I start laughing about it again. One of the lines about it, I start to sing it, and it goes on for hours. This movie's got no less than five directors. John Carr was tied to Phil Bjordan. He made his first movies he directed, like the Western, the the Talisman, The Star Maker, Buster Lad, and Fugitive Lovers. He also made uh, Death Wish Club, Maryland Live and Behind Bars, slash Scream Your Head Off, Too Bad About Jack, Dead Girls Don't Tango, uh, and The Case of Harry Billings and The Case of Greta Carter in this movie, Connors in this movie. Phil Marshak, who directed The Case of Claire Hansen segment, starred in Hollywood as an assistant for Jerry Lewis, an open Georgie girl, which is one of the first gay bars in Los Angeles. He also directed several adult films, such as Dracula Sucks, Night Flight, Space Virgins, Intimate Lessons, the bisexual westerns, The Savages, and Blue Ice, a porn film in which a detective digs up an ancient book with the power to turn any woman into a nymphomaniac that's wanted by Nazis who survived World War II. That's probably why he also directed Cataclysm, which has Nazis in it. Tom McGowan, who is credited as a director of the Claire chapter, wrote the Russ Meyer movie Cherry, Harry, and Raquel, and also directed Savage Journey. And George D. Tallis is also credited for parts of Claire. He's the only person in this who can going to be a graduate of Stanislav's uh, famous art theater in Moscow. He also directed Espionage and Tangiers and Assignment Skybolt, two Euro spy movies. Jay Schlossberg Cohen directed the actual Night Train segment that's in between these, as well as another movie that is a continuation of the same cast and crew, which is Cry Wilderness, uh, which, you know what, we're this long. Let's just get into it. Cry Wilderness is a Bigfoot meets E.T. epic of pure maniacal weirdness. It was written by Jordan, directed by Schlossberg Cohen. The origin of the movie is that someone at Visto International, a uh, small theatrical motion picture company, produced films in the early 80s, uh, really cheap ones, and they had some success with the Bigfoot movie in 78 that made $4 million off a $150,000 budget. No one knows what this movie was. They only made four movies. No one can find it, but let's just say that it existed. And Visto hired Yuri to write a new Bigfoot movie. They said, cut out the horror, no violence, profanity, or sex. Yuen replied, this movie is going to be about nothing. They replied, we want it to be about nothing. And that's what they got. Uh, you have to also be okay with the fact that uh, Bigfoot can just show up and visit a kid and warn him that his dad is going to die unless he leaves school and cries wilderness. It's also a movie where seasoned outdoorsmen have no idea how to handle weapons, continually pointing them directly at each other, planting muzzles of rifles into the dirt, and even running with their fingers on the triggers. Horrible uh, weapon uh, skills here. There's also mystical Native Americans, a park ranger who never wears his uniform, raccoons who can knock on doors, a child who's obsessed with raccoons to the point that he allows them into the kitchen sink to eat, a principal who is a Xerox of William Daniels, a school that's cool with a student wearing a Bigfoot medallion as part of his uniform, and moments where the film goes completely out of focus. I mean, repeatedly. Are you cool with seeing Bigfoot zipper? How much B-roll footage is too much? And are you ready for Ernest Country Rock in a movie that feels like it was made in 1978 and not 1987 and is also somewhat religious but is not religious it feels like either canadian or a religious movie and if you know what i mean and i think you do anyway sisters on the telephone gossiping again juniors at the arcade smoking with his friends 
down. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody but you. There's a half an hour of one man droning on about Night Train to Terror. You know it. You love it. Maybe, maybe not. Anyways, again, you can come to the website at BNS About Movies and you can email me at BNS About Movies at gmail.com. Now let's hit that music I paid for that sounds like it came from Majalo and we'll see you next episode.